Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Collier. I'm the Executive Director of Renew Theatres, and I want to thank you for joining us. Um, I've lost count. Uh, we've been doing a lot of these Film 101s over the past year, um, and it's really fun to have this monthly event where we can watch a great film and then join together for conversation. Um, so the this program virtually uh, invites members from all of our four theaters that we operate. So I want to welcome uh, those of you from the Ambler, the County, the Highway, and the Princeton Garden Theater, and anyone who is outside of our immediate uh, vicinity, thank you for joining us online for this discussion. Um, this program is made possible by the VESTA Fund, and that uh, they make it free for members. And that's a wonderful thing, uh, because we love to be able to offer this to our members. Membership is what allows our theaters to keep operating, and has been even more important this past year. Um, so thank you to everyone who is, is a member for your support. And thank you to the VESTA Fund for uh, allowing us to have this program and to continue it. Um, okay, so quickly, just some, some Zoom protocols. Uh, for those of you who are new to all of this, as I mentioned, uh, we request that everyone stay on mute unless you're speaking. That just makes it easier so that we're not talking over each other or hearing extraneous conversation. Um, Hannah is going to uh, do a little talk on the film, and then we'll open it up to question and feature. Um, and I'll be moderating that and just keeping an eye out for anyone who has hands raised, and I'll call on you. Um, if you can't find the raise hand feature, uh, you can just raise your hand in the video, and I'll, I'll look for that. Um, or if I'm not reaching you, uh, you can always just unmute and say uh, that, that I missed you. Um, the other thing is that the chat is functional and we invite you to participate in the chat. Um, often the chat serves as a very lively sidebar where there's a lot of interesting uh, tidbits and facts and conversation and uh, funny notes shared. Um, and if there's anything uh, that shows up in the chat, um, questions that will fit for the rest of the group, uh, we'll pull those into the main thread as well. Uh, we are thrilled to have Hannah back to lead this um, as always. Um, and let me just quickly, for those of you who don't know Hannah um, and haven't had the chance to, to hear her pedigree, um, Hannah is a writer for Turner Classic Movies and has scripted the introductions for movies that air on the network and are delivered by the hosts. Um, she has also written hosted introduction for films on HBO Max, Filmstruck, and classic movies screened to the theaters or in theaters around the country as part of the TCM Fathom Events Big Screen Classic Series. Um, and this is a ongoing monthly series with Hannah. Um, so once a month, you're able to tune in with us to discuss a classic film. Um, and I know uh, you can also see Hannah in some other places if you're part of the TCM uh, chat events, which I know Hannah might mention as well. I think uh, you had a chance to maybe see her or hear her name mentioned in one of those. Um, so it is now my pleasure to turn things over to Hannah. Um, and I know it worked so well last time that I think we're going to announce what our next film is right off the bat before we dive into this one. So Hannah. Great. Thanks so much, Chris. Can everyone hear me? We're good. Um, so yeah, as Chris said, uh, it worked last time to announce the next movie um, from the get go. We've done two kind of heavy dramas these last two months. And as the weather gets nice, and as we probably all could use a break from a heavy drama, um, I'm going to switch gears and take us into lighter territory for next month uh, with the classic 1940 screwball comedy, His Girl Friday. Um, which uh, uh, many people may know, may know well. Um, there's also a, a slight TCM connection reason um, for, for bringing that into the mix next month in June. Um, there's a lot going on that I've written for TCM in June that um, the themes kind of are all over the board. One thing I writ wrote about was a double feature of Cary Grant movies directed by uh, one of his favorite directors, Howard Hawks. Um, his Girl Friday is one of those collaborations. It's not one that's airing in uh, June uh, as part of that double feature. It is, however, part of a um, package that you can still find on HBO Max. I don't know how many HBO Max subscribers there are, but if you have HBO Max, um, the TCM Film Festival, which I was so excited to see 
so many of your faces uh, as part of some of those events over this past weekend. The TCM Film Festival aired on uh, Turner Classic Movies over the weekend. Traditionally, it's been held in person in LA, um, but this year, obviously, because of COVID, it was done virtually and was done both on the network and as a separate you could do both or you could, if you only had HBO Max, tune in and stream um, some of the festival offerings on HBO Max. It so happens that they are uh, keeping those on HBO Max for a little while longer. So if you have HBO Max, all you have to do is go to open the app, go to the home screen and scroll down until you see the TCM logo. You'll see it kind of all the way at the bottom. Um, and click on that. And then it should open up uh, something that says TCM Festival. And in that, uh, there's a whole lot of excellent offerings that are still available for a short time, including some interviews with um, stars, like, for instance, there was a great um, uh, introduction to West Side Story that was hosted by TCM host Ben Mankiewicz with Rita Moreno, Russ Tamblin, and George Chakiris talking about the movie. There are all these terrific interviews with, with a lot of great talent that are still available, as are some of these movies. And one of those collections is a Howard Hawks comedy collection. So I do know that His Girl Friday is available um, to stream on HBO Max. It's also available in other places. If you've well, never seen I, it, yeah, go ahead. Could I interrupt? quickly, because yes. I did want to share one other thing. Um, I did want to offer one of those other places to everyone um, as a, a little bit of an advanced uh, uh, inside scoop. Uh, we are actually working on the process of looking to reopen the theaters. And our goal will to be ha to have all four of our theaters open uh, in June. And one of the things that we are hoping to do is, to, or planning to do, is to have one of the films that we open with be His Girl Friday. Um, so that uh, you will have a chance either to watch it on HBO Max or some of these other channels. But if you want to come and see it in the theater, uh, we're going to have a couple screenings in advance of the next discussion so that you can see it with a crowd and see it on the big screen. And then we'll join back here um, in this platform to, uh, to talk about it. But there, there's another way that you can see the film. That is the way that I plan to see the film. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it also uh, is, I should say, June 15th is a Tuesday is when the, when the next talk is going to be. And just as a quick caveat before we get into uh, this week, this month's movie, um, if you've never seen His Girl Friday or it's been quite a long time since you've seen the movie, it is a movie that's famous for many things, but one of which is very fast dialogue. So um, the dialogue is really rapid fire and often overlapping. So if you watch it with the option to use closed captioning, it might be a good option to take just so that you hear all the gems as they're thrown out because the dialogue is terrific, but it is very fast. So um, again, that's June 15th uh, at 7.30. That's a Tuesday next month. And we'll be talking about His Girl Friday. But tonight on a much darker note, um, <laughs> the Oxbow incident. Um, so the Oxbow incident, again, as this month's tie into the TCM Festival, it's a movie that I would uh, uh, categorize as a discovery, which is a, a category TCM was using with movies at the festival as a type of collection of movies that you may know or you may be discovering them for the first time. They're kind of these rare gems. Um, the Oxbow Incident certainly an undisputed classic, but it might not be one that everybody who's a classic movie fan has seen before. Um, so I hope that that was the case for at least some people here. And this is one of those times where I don't wanna forget, just by show of hands, if you're on video, how many people had never seen the Oxbow Incident before this week's discussion? Awesome. Okay, that's great. I'm. I hope that if, I hope that you enjoyed it, and at least I hope that it made some sort of impact, because um, I think it's one of those movies that is pretty powerful. Um, so I'm going to talk about it, uh, give some context for the movie, and it's one of those movies that we can talk about the movie, or and and or we can also talk about what. Um, the movie brings up because there's a lot in it to, to unpack too. So I'll talk about the movie itself up front um, and I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen to give you some visuals. This is always a little song and dance here. Here we go. And do we see it? Do we see the Oxbow incident? Okay, great. So, um, all right, one moment. So the Oxbow incident um, is 
really, it's one of the most important Westerns to come out of Hollywood's golden age, um, but it is an odd kind of Western. If you're a fan of Westerns, if you know a lot of, of movies in the genre, um, you'll know that it's not the norm. Um, it's not, there's not much action in it. Uh, there's, it's much more claustrophobic, much more intimate, um, much more character driven. And by that, I mean, not just a good guy and a villain, there's an ensemble of really fleshed out characters. Um, and it's all, it's got a very stage play like feel to it, which uh, is kind of, it, it's sort of a morality play set that happens to be set in the old west, but it is still considered a western. Um, it was based on a novel that was written in 1938 published in 1940, so the movie came out 43. So it was published just before it was made into a film um, by Walter Van Tilburg Clark, who, uh, if you keep in mind the year, he, he wrote it in 1938, published 1940. He was writing, he wanted to write about what was happening in Germany at the time, which was the rise of the Nazi party. And he wanted to address the idea that fascism, a fascist mentality could arise in any group of people. And that's what he, that was what he was trying to tackle, but he decided to make it into a Western in his novel, driving home the, the point by, by setting it in the most American of genres. And the book was published in 1940 and it was a successful book. And one of the people who read it and was just stunned by it was director William Wellman. And this is Wellman on the left-hand side. Um, William Wellman, had bought the rights to, to adapt the book as a movie. Um, it's the only time in his career when he put his own money into a project, that's how much he believed in it. Um, and he shopped it around to Hollywood producers, but nobody really wanted to take a chance on it. A lot of people felt that it was not going to be a hit at the box office. So they, they said no. Um, the one producer who did say yes was Daryl Zanuck, and that's Zanuck on the right. He was the head of 20th Century Fox. And in part, Zanuck um, was known throughout his career for being the movie mogul who would take a chance on a more controversial film. If you look at his credits, he's often producing movies that pushed the boundaries a little bit. Um, but in this case, this was not a passion project for Daryl Zanuck. Uh, he made this movie, he was sort of browbeaten into it, agreeing to produce it for Wellman because uh, he got Wellman as pa a package deal, uh, hiring him to make a couple of other movies for Fox. So Wellman really, really pushed, it was William Wellman who believed in this film and got the chance to make it at Fox. Um, but hiring William Wellman was not really a risk for Zanuck because he was a very established, successful director. He might not be a director whose name you know, um, or whose name comes up a lot when you think of the great directors of the golden years of Hollywood, but he's certainly a director who's responsible for some of the biggest landmark movies early on uh, in Hollywood history, including the first movie to win the Academy Award for Best Picture at the very first Academy Awards, which was the 1927 silent film Wings. Um, Wings was a, if you've never seen it, it was a um, drama about World War I fighter pilots. And this was something that Wellman knew intimately. He had been an ace fighter pilot pilot in World War I. Uh, he was American, he joined the French Foreign Legion and developed his reputation as this really daring, kind of crazy guy. He earned the nickname Wild Bill Wellman and his exploits made him famous and caught the attention of people like Douglas Fairbanks in Hollywood who thought Wellman would make a really cool actor. And he, Fairbanks brought William Wellman to Hollywood as an actor um, and thought he had a lot of personality to bring to the screen. As it turns out, William Wellman hated acting. He thought it an unmanly profession. Um, and he quickly wanted to be behind the scenes instead and rose in the ranks in the 1920s to become a director. And like I said, Wings was his first masterpiece. And then with the dawn of talking pictures, he made some landmark movies in the 1930s like The Public Enemy in 1931, which was the one of the definitive gangster movies that introduced James Cagney as a gangster type and set the tone for his whole career. Then he went on not only to direct, but also to write the original 1937, A Star is Born, 
Um, and Wellman was nominated for a couple of Oscars in his career. The only one he won was not as a director, but as a writer for A Star is Born. And he has gone on to be credited as the original story writer on every version of A Star is Born ever since. Um, it was his idea. And so this was what William Wellman had done before the Oxbow incident. So he was already really an established uh, director in Hollywood. Um, now he may have convinced Daryl Zanuck to produce the Oxbow incident, but he couldn't really convince him to give the film a huge budget. So as you may have see, noticed, the, um, the set and the lighting, the production values sort of suffer as a result. So uh, that's been a source of criticism of the film um, over the years that the naturalism of the acting and of the dialogue is really at odds with the very artificial look of the background. Um, and it's very clearly made on a soundstage, uh, not you know a John Ford Western shot in Monument Valley. This is a very different type of, of movie, um, but that's okay. And William Wellman was okay with it because he knew that the landscape was not the star of this picture. The star was the characters and the dialogue. That's what this movie was really about. And what a collection of characters in this movie. So um, it, it's worth mentioning all the people who are appearing in this film who really create these indelible characters. Um, so Henry Fonda uh, is the star of the film and he he's the star in name only i think really because he was the big name star at this point um but he you know he's very much part of an ensemble of some of the best character actors of the era and some who were also just kind of getting started at the same time so harry morgan a lot of a lot of familiar faces you might have recognized so harry morgan is his sidekick uh harry morgan just at the start of his career, and, and certainly a face that you might recognize from when he's older. Um, he had a you know long career as a character actor in movies and on TV and shows like MASH. Um, so he went on to, to continue a long career after this. Frank Conroy as the major was a great character actor at this time. Jane Darwell, who uh, played this fabulous role for a woman in a movie in the 1940s, um, she had just recently won the Oscar for, uh, for playing Ma Jode, Henry Fonda's mother, in The Grapes of Wrath in 1940. She won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress and shortly after that made this movie. Very different kinds of roles. And if you've seen The Grapes of Wrath, you can just those two characters show you Jane Darwell's range as, as a supporting actor. Um, and then you have people like Lee Whipper, who's not even credited in the movie, which is such a shame, um, because I think that he gets to play one of the most, by, by light years, one of the most interesting, deep, complicated, fleshed out and human characters that any black actor got to play in Hollywood in the 1940s. Um, Lee Whipper in the, in the role of Sparks of the Reverend in this movie. Um, and it definitely a part that we can, we can talk more about, but Lee Whipper had this very long career, more than six decades as a stage actor and was the first African-American ever to join the Actors' Equity Association. Um, he was also a, a Howard University educated lawyer, although he never practiced law, but from a family of, of very educated activists um, and he decided to go on the stage instead and had this incredible career. Um, and then you have people like Harry Davenport who showed up in just about every movie in this era uh, as the, um, as the uh, store clerk, store owner who, who fights for the right cause. And then Francis Ford as the deranged old man, older brother of director John Ford, uh, the great you know, director of so many things, but especially Westerns. And Francis Ford had been the more famous Ford in uh, the silent era, he was a big movie star and then was totally overshadowed by his younger brother who became a star director. And Francis Ford, if you know a lot of John Ford movies, you've seen Francis Ford in a lot of them in these supporting character parts, although they were not on speaking terms most of the time and that he just showed up and played his part and left. Um, but he was also a great, at this point in his career, character actor. And then you've got two people who would soon be major movie stars in their own right. Dana Andrews there on the left and Anthony Quinn on the right. Dana, both of them just at the start of their career. So again, adding talent to this pool of this cast, um, you have Dana Andrews was 
uh, only in movies for a couple of years, started in the in 1940. And this was his first really significant role uh, showing his talent. The next year starred in one of the definitive film noirs, Laura. And then in 1946 starred in the definitive post-World War II drama, The Best Years of Our Lives. So this was a really, this was like the turning point for Dana Andrews' career in this movie. And then Anthony Quinn uh, was on the verge of leaving Hollywood. He'd been in the business for a couple of years and wasn't getting any interesting roles. And this was one of his first interesting roles. Um, and he continued, the next decade was a little bit like touch and go for him. But then in the fifties, his career really took off with two Oscar wins for um, Viva Zapata with Marlon Brando, Lust for Life with Kirk Douglas. He won the supporting actor award, starred in La Strada. Um, and in Lawrence of Arabia in the 60s and Zorba the Greek. I mean, he went on and he continued to act until 2001 when he died. So his career really was just taking off at this point as well. Um, so this remarkable uh, group of talent comes together and the film premieres in 1943. And um, like I said, producers were hesitant and skeptical about its box office potential as it turned out rightly so because the movie premiered uh, in 1943 and was a box office disappointment. Because think of the year, America was fully engaged in World War II and American audiences wanted to see either a movie that would glorify uh, you know, American ideals and patriotism and be really gung-ho, rah-rah, America, you know, uh, you know, pictures or escapist movies like lighthearted MGM musicals that were so popular in the 1940s. The Oxbow incident really was neither. It was showing a much darker side of American potential. And uh, it really wasn't a box office hit. The critics on the other hand really loved it and praised it. And it went on to earn one Oscar nomination, only one. And that was for best picture of 1943, which it lost to Casablanca, which obviously sent a much more uh, uplifting wartime message. Um, but despite its box office, you know, not failure, but disappointment, uh, it did set the stage for what would become the trend in Westerns a decade later. It was a little too ahead of its time at the time, because in the 1950s, what happened in the Western was things got a lot more complicated and a lot darker, as the Oxbow incident did a decade earlier. Um, if you know Westerns well, you know that prior to 1950s, it was a genre that really glorified the Old West. It was very cookie cutter, full of stereotypes, the good guys and the bad guys, the cowboys and the Indians, the, you know, it was very, very cut and dry. And, um, you know, very naive in a lot of ways about a lot of things. And then the 1950s came around with movies like High Noon, 310 to Yuma, all these Jimmy Stewart, Anthony Mann movies, there are a lot of darker movies that were really about psychology and deep, dark, you know, anti-hero types. The line between hero and villain was very, very blurred. The landscape of the American West became a harsh landscape. This was what happened after World War II in the Westerns, but the Oxbow incident did it first. And it did it in 1943 at a time when audiences and Hollywood just really weren't ready. So um, that's all I'm gonna say about the movie because I know there's a lot to talk about with it and I'd love to hear all that you have to say. So I'm going to um, stop the screen share and I'd love to hear everything that you guys are thinking about this. So I don't know if there was some stuff in the chat but I can catch up. If Chris is here, I, I see some things here so let me just... Uh, has it ever happened before or since that a movie would get a Best Picture nomination without any other nominations? I don't think it has happened since. No. I'm not sure if it happened before. Um, Grand Hotel. And I, I do see a hand here. I see right. Tom. I can see. <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, good evening. I um I was I was curious. Um, so I, I'd seen this movie a number of times before. 
um, when I saw it this time, one of the things that struck me is it could be seen as a, an anti-lynching movie, as a movie that was commenting on lynchings in the South, uh, you know, um, which were fairly prevalent through that time. Um, and there was, I, I'd never really focused, there was that short conversation between Sparks and Henry Fonda's character, where Sparks said his brother had been lynched. Um, and, and Fonda asked, well, did he do it? And he said, I really don't know. I'm wondering, did, did anybody see it, this movie in that light? Has that ever been, um, you know, has it ever been thought of as a commentary on, um, on Southern, uh, on the lynchings uh, that were going on in this country throughout, well, really throughout the forties and beyond? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear what other people have to say. It has often been compared to another movie with a very similar plot, similar theme, The Hang 'em High, which is a Clint Eastwood movie that also takes up the same topic of lynching. And, and those two have been paired to in terms of that particular theme. Um, but yeah, I, I see. Yeah, Valerie, go ahead. How about Fury? Fury with Spencer. And Fury, Trip. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another lynch mob and uh, pretty hot and heavy with it. But I, I mean, I know that it's about fascism, but I, I agree. Lynch is, lynching is very strongly, uh, it's, it's, it's at the core of this movie, you know, wrongful lynching. And I was saying in the chat, uh, I looked up Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit. That song had come out just a year before the book came out. You know, so there's a lot of overlap in, in mediums, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I saw your hand up next. Yeah, I had a different point. I noticed um, Dana Andrews was such a nice character in this film. And in many of his other films, he played the bad guy. I mean, even, even in um, the best years of our lives, he, was, he wasn't really a bad guy, but he was sort of portrayed that way and characterized that way by the, you know, by um, the father of the, object of his desire <laughs> yeah he uh he often was playing these types that were that like fate dealt a bad hand to he was just always playing these guys who were um you know uh always a little bit on on the defensive and always a little bit either either he was you know had to deal roughly with people because you know life had been rough to him but yeah, I mean, I think that he, this at least showed more depth of character. I mean, his prior like, you know, notable performance prior to this movie was in the screwball comedy Ball of Fire um, as like a gangster guy. Um, and that was just a very like, you know, one dimensional character part. And this is the movie that showed that he had dimension. His career though, didn't really last much beyond the forties. It was, uh, that was really the peak of it. Brian? Uh, yeah, what uh, struck me when I was watching it this time was it was so cynical, like Wellman's uh, pre-code films. Uh, when Gil and Art first ride into town, there's that dog that crosses the street in front of them. And then at the end, when they're leave riding out of town, the dog is again crossing back to the same side of the street, which seems to suggest that nothing is really going to change, even though the sheriff said people will be held responsible. Uh, so the, the, the cynicism of the movie just really surprised me. I remember the first time I watched it on VHS, I expected Henry Fonda to give this great speech and save everyone. Yeah. And when that didn't happen, I was, I'm shocked every time I see the film that it gets that dark. Yeah, oh, it's such a great point about the dog going back and forth and how it's just gonna continue to be the same. I think that the, I always wanna do this movie as a double feature with 12 Angry Men because I think that it's just such a great, you know, two, two very similar, you know, group grappling with a moral issue and Henry Fonda in the mix at two different stages of his career. Um, you do want him to be, you know, the voice that's championing, but he's not even the first one who steps forward when they say, you know, who's on this side. 
Um, so it's a really interesting case. I should add that he, he was the other one with William Wellman who really championed this production. Uh, Henry Fonda was kind of like, he didn't like a lot of the roles that he was getting at this point in his career. There were only a few that he was really excited to play. And this was one of them. I see Valerie, yeah. Um, I read in a review that according in the book, it's Harry Morgan's character that is really the main character, not the Henry Fonda character. He was just more of the, he was the sidekick. So maybe that's another reason, you know, he, in the outline of the book, he's not gonna be the one that steps up and saves the day. And that's, the, I think that's it. The, the whole thing is about the mob. There's really nobody except maybe the Harry Daver, Henry Davenport, Harry Davenport character, who really is like at his wits end trying to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, they're already off and running. They're not, they're not about to listen to anybody, even if it's Henry Fonda, they're not going to listen to him, you know? So. Absolutely. That, that ties into what, um, Barbara, I see your comment here in the chat about, you would think that it's the adrenaline of the mob that takes over and there's no reflection on the act and how there is, um, there is in the movie. And you're bringing up about the book as well. So it's worth noting, I'll just mention a couple of differences. Uh, between the movie and the book, because they're, they're interesting choices that were made. Uh, one of them is that at the end, when the sheriff does miraculously show up a minute too late, um, that he, in the book, says, kind of looks at everyone and, and says, okay, I didn't see anything. Let's go about our business. As opposed to in the movie, you know, he says, you had all better watch out because I'm not going to have any mercy. Um, and then another, uh, there's another small moment with the major, Major Tetley, uh, where his son, who's been so, you know, abused by him throughout the whole story, um, commits suicide at the end of the book. He like goes into the barn and hangs himself. And then that's what prompts the major to kill himself. Um, and then the last thing to note is that the letter that Dana Andrews writes um, is mentioned all the time in the book, but not ever read. There's no content of that. So that extraordinary letter that he reads and that wonderful shot, I mean, that's really one of the incredible shots in the movie where you don't even see Henry Fonda's eyes, you just see his mouth. Um, and that, uh, that text that he's reading was written by the film's screenwriter and producer Lamar Trotty, who wrote a lot of other uh, movies that Henry Fonda was in, a lot of John Ford movies too. Um, but he wrote that and William Wellman, the director, loved it and thought it was a really perfect uh, thing to insert at the end of the movie. Polly and Reese, I see your hands. We'll get to you in one second. There was a comment in the chat that I wanted to bring up first. Uh, Nikki, and Sh Nikki shared that while the budget may have been low, um, the, the cinematography uh, was stunning. And I was wondering, Hannah, if there was any, any notes that you could share on the cinematography. Yeah, um, the cinematographer was Arthur Miller, not that Arthur Miller, different Arthur Miller. <laughs> and uh, he, he won the Oscar, actually, the movie was not nominated for anything other than Best Picture, but he won the Oscar the same year um, for a different movie, for the Song of Bernadette, for black and white cinematography. Um, he, he was a great, he also, he was another, per, a lot of these people worked with John Ford a lot. I keep mentioning him tonight. He worked with John Ford. He, he won another Oscar for uh, the gorgeous cinematography for How Green Was My Valley. That was also the same cinematographer. If you know that movie, that's a really, really powerful uh, film. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot there. No. Uh, Polly? I was... I've seen it before, and but not for many years. And I was I was really struck by how like subtle and almost modern a lot of the uh, psychological subtext was. It, um, you know how many characters were pretending or fronting. I guess is the yeah. kids would say. Um, you know, you had the the fake Southern uh, general. Um, you know, the the incredible drunk at the beginning and all that business. And he's of course the first to, you know be in favor of the violence and um, the, the deputy um, kind of goes on and on all these characters motivated by shame or, you know, fear of being found out, um, the judge, um, 
yeah, I just found that pretty extraordinary. And other than just your comments on that, I wondered what you made of that portrait in the first team. Because, yeah, I'm never yeah. sure what to make of that business. So, thanks. I'd love to hear what other people have to say about it too. I think in terms of the uh, the the fronting, as you say, I think that's such a great way of putting it because there is that decisive moment where three people have to whip the horse out from under them, right? And they have to actually do the task of you know, hanging these men. Um, and only two of them are really gung-ho to do it in the end. And everyone else is kind of shying away. So this idea that they're not, they're not really in it. They're in it as a collective mob mentality, but when it comes time to actually do the deed, it's only Jane Darwell and um and and you know the man who's got the 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 bit of vengeance between his teeth because it was his friend who was killed. Um, so that yeah, the the portrait yeah I want to I want to ask everybody I mean that that's like a a plot point the portrait and the Rose Mapin character who comes in I mean this this idea of this woman who's elusive or whatever what you all think of that I have my own ideas but I'm I'm curious to know what you think yeah Barbara go ahead oh yeah I I didn't understand where where that came from it seemed like it just went nowhere and that that part of the plot was very superfluous um but the other thing i wanted to say was it and maybe it's related to this is that um when i listened to some commentary on a dvd they they met, talked a lot about basically the misogyny in the film in the story intentionally um that it was a lot of the um the things that motivated or the, the criticism of people who might have been sympathetic was like you're acting like a woman you're acting you know you're too sensitive and like especially the son of the colonel it's like and all that suppressing um uh, a feminine view or a more sensitive compassionate view mm -hmm. um was kind of anti-woman and then you have this like idealized sexy woman i mean but it didn't quite fit together for me i'll just say that yeah yeah Absolutely, there are two very different images of, of womanhood in this movie. The, you know, the woman who is the sexy young woman. They, they, the old movie opens by saying there are only three women in the town. One is like 82 and blind and the, you know, and then there's Jane Darwell, who's the one of the two who's man enough to do the task at the end, right? So yeah, other thoughts on this? Please. Oh, unmute you're on mute. So, can't hear you. I'll respond to that, but I have two other comments. One is I thought that the issue with the picture was really just to draw the audience in. Am I there? I'm looking at someone else's picture. Can you see me? <laughs> yes, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I thought that um, it was just to draw the audience in, in a way, because the whole issue with the woman and the stagecoach and all that was so irrelevant to this, really, I thought. So I think it was just to capture the audience early on. In fact, in that, in that um, <clears throat> uh, advertising, it said, watch it from the beginning. Be sure to watch from the beginning. So maybe that you, it was intended that you should just get hooked by that. But I have two other comments. One is I wanna know why Lee Whipper was not credited and why just in general, um, in many films, uh, people were not credited. He had a major role and should have been credited. Was it because he was black? Um, at a certain point in the cast roster, names just dropped off in every movie um, that, you know, people who didn't have, you know, X number of lines or whatever it was just weren't credited. Uh, in, in this particular case with him, I'm not sure if that's one of the contributing factors, but um, it, it only, only so many people ended up on the bill in, at this time in a lot of movies that was very, very common. Um, I will say though, back to the point about the, the, the women, the Rose Mapin and that, that portrait, because I have some thoughts about it. The, um, the town is a very, very boring place. And that dragging quality at the beginning where he's looking and it's a picture of a man who, and his comment is, why doesn't he just get there already? Nothing's happening. There's no action happening. And that's a huge impetus for why the mob forms. They say, you know, they've never seen a real live three person lynching before. And they, 
that's their entertainment. And so, and I think that there's a lot to be said for why, you know, people get involved in mob mentality today too. There's, you know, on social media or whatever it may be, because it's a way to be kind of in the mix and entertained and, and whatnot, and to feel like something's going on. And I, I also think that for, uh, it's a plot device also with the Rose Mapin character. That's why Henry Fonda's in town. He came back to town for this girl. Right. And so that's why that's why he happens to be there in this, and and I would say also why he's in a bad mood throughout because she's rejected him, and also the two other things is that uh, when their stagecoach goes through, that's an initial burst of oh did they get the rustlers is that who it is are they the ones who are going you know, and they're not it's it's this woman instead, um, and also the idea that. He, he's this cynical guy about love. And then he sees this guy who he participated in killing who had this marriage that was good. And that had, you know, he wanted to write this incredible letter to his wife that he's, he, it's part of, I see it as part of his character arc that he gets to see through the eyes of some other man, uh, mm -hmm. what it's like to have um, a, a better relationship. That's great. Yeah, that, that's my two cents about it. I have one other one other comment about that about the film. Um, if you think of it in terms of the Nazi themes, I think there were a lot of representations of people that Hitler killed. For example, that Gerald seemed to be a gay character. There was a black character. There was a a Mexican or whatever um, he was supposed to be. I guess Anthony Quinn's character, an old person, people who were not, you know, um, just in sort of uh, stereotypic of the people. That were, and so you know the but the gay theme seemed to be there with mm -hmm. yeah. with the son. Was that in the book? Do you know? I don't. I think the the emasculating, uh, not standing up and being the cowardly idea that he was he was you know ashamed to his father was there. Yeah. Okay. No, it isn't. Mm -hmm. Brian, I saw your hand up again. I, no, I was just going to mention about the portrait, but Hannah pretty much had the same idea I did, so I got nothing. <laughs> gotcha. And before we go to you, Tom, uh, Julia Benson had a great comment in the chat. I just wanted to, if you wanted to share that with everyone. Um, if not, I could read it for you. Um, yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, I had, um, here, let me just turn off my, <laughs> my camera. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, were it not for the plot of the woman, like, initially, when I was watching it, I was like, what, what's the point of this whole sideline plot with the woman? And what, what's the point of her being there? It's almost like, Henry, no character in this movie was 100% good, like everybody had their own investment in something and I really wonder like we kind of cheer on Henry Fonda's character when he sides with the people that were being lynched um, and he's going over to the other side and he's standing with everybody but if he if he didn't have anything to lose you know like if he if he were a man that had nothing left to lose would he have cared would he have gone to the other side or would he have just joined the mob um so that that was just why I thought like that was that was a plot point to push him into this uh, mind state of you know I don't have anything to lose and I might side with people like I might side with the minority of people because if the mob turns on me what do I have to lose I don't care anymore you know that's a great point yeah it's a great read of that of that plot point too. Um. I was actually going to piggyback on Julia's comment because I agree. I thought it was a really, really good comment. I mean, Henry Ford's character, uh, you know, it, it's, it is not, you know, it's not a pure character at all. It's, um, you know, I, there's that scene at the beginning where he gets into the fight at the bar and he not only hits the guy, but then jumps up and kicks him in the face. I mean, it was really very, very violent you know, by him. And, and I think Julie's question about what he would have done, uh, all things being equal, is a really good one. And, and it reminded me of Henry Fonda, um, you know, who, who you think of as a good guy. And, and not too long ago, I, for the first time, saw um, 
uh, once upon a time in the West where yeah. he was Villain. a bad guy. Yeah. And it was like, whoa, he was, he, he is, he is very, very good at playing these complex characters. Chilling. Yeah. Extremely good. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because it's funny to think about, as you're saying, you know, we associate Henry Fonda, if you know a lot of his movies with these really idealistic types. Um, and it, that's what he would have been known for at this point in his career too, playing Tom Joad in The Grapes of Wrath and young Abraham Lincoln and young Mr. Lincoln and, you know, these very idealistic young men. Um, it's, it would be interesting to think of a different actor playing this character. And if you would jump to think right away that he's, you know, a, a you know, not as good of a guy from the beginning. We like root for him because he's Henry Fonda um, and give him the benefit of the doubt, I think, to a certain extent, because that's the type, that's the image that he had. Yeah. Holly? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I just was thinking, and uh, was it Reese who made some comments about the types of people representing sort of types that were, um, you know, the earliest and most um, victimized um, of the Holocaust and so forth, that they, these were the, you know, weak people in that society um, who were marginalized and, you know, Fonda and, and Henry Morgan's character spent a lot of the movie trying to fit in and saying like, well, we better go along with this because we just showed up and we don't want to be, you know, victimized. They're not exactly like the heroic, you know, standing against the mob types. Um, and about the, 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 women, the woman, I thought it was going to go into like, is there's a trope in some Westerns about like the righteous, the women's brigade that shows up like the old ladies that come and kick out the, the young, sexy woman um, and they kind of reference that um, in the plot as terms yeah, yeah. of what's happened to that character and actually Jane Darwell would be like the, per the perfect person to play that um, but which made her character so much more incredible um, in that same era to be playing against against that and yet she's like the worst perpetrator in some ways. Um, yeah and plays very much that type in Gone with the Wind yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I would say that I think that something that strikes me every time I see this movie is that when you think there's one example of the character type, like there's this like stereotype or whatever in the movie, there's something to counterbalance that. So like when you when we talk about Anthony Quinn's character, yes, he's like he's, you know, the the Mexican gambler who's, you know, the the dangerous whatever, but he's also balanced by the poncho, you know, sidekick character who's who's just you know a much more stereotyped uh mexican character and anthony quinn comes out and says i speak 10 other languages too and you know and he's got all this depth and nuance to him so you see these two very different examples of of character types they're kind of exploding stereotypes which was something the oxbow incident did before other westerns did it exploding stereotypes happened, like I said, in the 50s, then in the 60s, uh, and in the 70s and on. But it wasn't really happening at this point. It was very unusual to have a character that didn't fit a stereotype of the genre at this point in the movies. Elise? Um, oh, I was just going to bring it back a little bit to, to politics, because um, I, th I didn't quite see a fascist connection. What I saw was a bit of an indictment of democracy in a way, because they repeated two, three, four times, well, whoever, um, you know, whichever way the vote goes, you know, the majority rules, do you all agree to go with the majority? Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's one of the perplexing things to me of this movie is that, you know, the majority was, you know, just full of garbage they were, you know, clearly wrong in every, in every respect. And it was just, you know, seven out of the whole mob that were right, but, you know, obviously drowned out by the greater proportion. It's a really interesting read. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great point. I'd love to hear what other people think about it. I would also say that the people who were in the majority, many of them don't speak in the movie. So there's a lot that, uh, you know, 
they might have felt silenced or they might have been characters representing people who get silenced by the louder voices that you know make them feel bullied or make them feel whatever in society you know because there is that powerful moment where you see they have to literally stand on which side they're going to be on and so that takes a tremendous amount of courage to make that physical move the same amount of courage it would take to or cowardice however you read it to hit the horse to make it go you have to like actually take the physical action to show how you feel and only a few are brave enough to do that in that moment but what what does everyone think about that or what you know that majority rule theme that comes up or other questions <laughs> Not here on mute. You want to talk? Was that was that Susan who came up to mute? If you have a comment, yeah, feel free to jump in. I don't see any hands, so anyone who wants to talk, please feel free to unmute and jump right in. I think it's more a question of mob psychology, mob rule, than majority rule. And I think it has a lot to do with situations today. And especially in light of uh, a lot of Liz Cheney's speech last night. And again, that was 147 to 1. She won support. And this is a movie I originally saw when it first came out. It had quite an impact because I still remember it 77 years later. Wow. Yeah, yes. I mean, I think that it is one of those movies that really, really sticks with people and also has relevance from one time to the next. I mean, I think it's, it's a movie that really uh, continues to, to have a powerful message regardless of what era you're watching it in. Yes. And yeah. applicability, yeah. And I had a, I had a question. Yeah. Um, it, it, was a, it was a very, very short film. I think it was, what, an hour and 15 minutes? Yeah. Was that uh, was that odd for a an A feature, you know, um, at that time? It just, you know, um, was there a reason why it was so short? Yeah, it was a it was a lower budget film, uh, which tended to run shorter. Um, I don't believe it played as the B movie on bills, um, but it it was on. It, maybe somebody has information about that, but. Um, it was not uncommon for a lower budget film to run a shorter length, yeah. And I think the movie has something to say about uh, the rush to judgment as well, because everyone in the movie who wants, who's approved of the lynching is just going on pure emotion and they're all worked up and they want to do something without any of the facts, yeah. which is something the others bring up, but they're so hot blooded by what they believe that they're going to flinch no matter what. Right. And the circumstantial evidence that they, they think mm -hmm. is en enough. Um, John, I saw your this hand. Is, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, this is Julie. I just, I just wanted to mention also like about the title. It's called the Oxbow Incident. And, you know, I, I initially was wondering like, why is it the Oxbow Incident? And, um, at least like I know from studying geology before that oxbow lakes, they're, they're formed when there's a wide meander of a river and it cuts off land. Hmm. And it, it just like, it completely isolates. It, formed, it forms this U and it sort of cuts off this land and isolates it. And I felt that like, kind of like that was what was happening to the characters in the movie. They were being cut off, isolated and just basically, um, killed <laughs> exterminated by, by the mob that, that yeah that's really really cool yes absolutely thank you for sharing that yeah, that's a really that's a really interesting point i hadn't hadn't thought of that i'm glad tom brought up the issue of the fact that it, at 75 minutes was such a short film and i agree with a lot of the things that people have said about the movie and its its relative strengths. But I thought in and I and I'm a person who likes who is one of those people who says that was a great movie if they'd only trimmed like 
15 minutes off the third act, it would have been perfect. But in this case, I thought there were a lot of things which I would have liked to have seen developed, which at the end left me feeling like there was part of the movie that wasn't there. You know, there were whole, you know, things with, uh, you know, the major and his son is alluded to about their conflict, but that's never really fleshed out in any kind of meaningful way. And even more so that the Henry Fonda with the woman he's coming back for, you know, that's a great scene that they have. And then the interaction with the new husband, and it's like two minutes and then it's gone. Yeah. And I felt like a lot of the motivation for the, for the lynching felt like it was just a given. I would have liked to have seen you know, more nuance in that where I know sometimes they did bring out like, well, we found the, we found the gun, his gun was there, or, you know, where's your, where's your bill of sale? But the crowd had all, was already in a fever pitch before that. So I would have liked to have seen it kind of go back and forth where the mob, rather than just acting on kind of pure blood, ven you know, blood emotion, would sort of have a rational uh, excuse. So I think mobs will do things, but it's more... They, they feel justified in what they're doing rather than like, let's just hang them and think about it later. Um, and I, I would have loved to have seen, this is one of those movies where I felt like if it had been another 20 minutes longer, maybe that was a budgetary consideration. Uh, but uh, I my only disappointment in the film was that it, it felt like it left a lot unsaid. Yeah, and it's something that I think the 1950s did a lot better with their Westerns. And, and it definitely was a, uh, an example of that period that it was made in that it was not fleshing out the psychology as much as the 50s westerns did if this is a kind of movie that appealed to you and you're interested in these more dark psychological westerns definitely look at look at the ones that came out of the 1950s because films like high noon 310 to yuma these and the movies that jimmy stewart made with director anthony mann uh, the Naked Spur, The Man from Laramie. These are movies that um, really unpacked the psychology of the yeah. characters and their motivations and uh, set it against the landscape of the Old West, but in a way that really disrupted what we think of. Um, and so that was something that was much more refined the next decade. This is definitely much more of a uh, rough, rough around the edges. Right, and I felt like this was sort of a it's really interesting when it was made and kind of what it's doing. Yeah. But I, I especially want to second what you're saying, Hannah, about the Anthony Mann, Jimmy Stewart film. Jimmy Stewart is, you know, obviously in the 50s, he does the Hitchcock stuff, which is dark. But the Anthony Mann Westerns that he does are so dark. And he, we think of him as the all American boy and, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Uh, he is so dark and and twisted at times. Winchester 73 is my, my favorite of those, where, um, you know, if you're interested, if this film, if you uh, like- The like wedding your appetite, yeah. Responded to this, yeah. Those, I think those are even better. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Reese, I see your hand up. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to thank John for mentioning, can you hear me? Yeah. For mentioning that scene with the, um, the new husband, uh, because it made sense to me finally why that even happened. Because at the end, when uh, Henry Fonda goes off with the letter to see the uh, the widow and and tell her, it's like there were only five women that were eligible <laughs> uh, available in the town, and so it, it left you feeling that he was going to go, you know, be the next husband of this of that woman. That's and true. but if he had not had that scene where he knew that she was married, I don't think he probably would have been waiting for her. So it kind of tied it together. So tied it together and you're reminding me of that one. Yeah. yeah. I actually wanted to follow up on one of the things that John mentioned in terms of fleshing out the characters and where it felt like there were pieces missing. Um, I did notice in the chat that Anne and maybe some others mentioned that they had read the book 
um, or it was required reading a long time ago. Um, but for anyone who had read the book, um, are any of those details fleshed out in there? Um, can anyone comment on that? Uh when I first read it, you know, I was probably about 14 or 15 years old, not even, I was in junior high. So I, I, all I remember was it was a short book and it was a good read and I liked this speech. That's all I can remember from the book because this speech really stays with you. I mean, the letter, I call it a speech, but it's the letter. Yeah, that moment with the Colonel's son and Dana Andrews exchanging a brief smile. Yeah, that's a great moment too. I don't see any other hands. Anyone else have any comments or questions? We are coming up on the hour. Um, but just seeing if anyone has any other thoughts. This is Julie. I just had one more thought. Getting back to the um, uh, when someone mentioned before about um, the theme of fascism and the sort of people that um, the Nazis went after um, and exterminated, they also exterminated a large um, group of Romani people. And prior to the Nazi regime, eugenics was happening and there was the, the wholesale slaughter of people who were like disabled and um, you know, and um, two of the characters also in this movie who die, the one character, he seemed a little, maybe um, he was the group of three men who were um, lynched. He seemed a little touched in the head, I, I suppose. And, he, and the one man had even said, you know, he doesn't know what he's doing. Let's let him go. He's fine. And they still kill him anyway. And that's basically what was happening to every person who ha had um, psychiatric illness or any kind of disability. They, they were murdered in hospitals. They were euthanized. Uh, and the other character of Anthony Quinn's character, he sort of reminded me of like uh, how the Romani people or the, I don't want to say gypsy people were considered also by everyone at that time. They were the drifters and they, they, the Nazis did away with them as well. So just wanted to point out like there was those similarities to those characters as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it was written about this time. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. more details came to light after the public, after the publication of the book uh, in terms of what was happening in Germany and across Europe, but um, definitely it was, it was meant to be about what was going on in Germany at the time, but transported to the American West. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, absolutely, all those parallels are, are right. What what was what was the intention, and also why the American public didn't want to see it in 1943. Um, and a lot of people knew that these things were happening, but they didn't want yeah. to talk about it, yeah. and they didn't they didn't want to see these things. And a lot of Hollywood movies did not talk about them at this point. This was very very uncommon to address in 1943. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hope if, if you were seeing this movie for the very first time, I hope that it'll stick with you. I hope that it was a, a, a discovery um, and that you enjoyed it on some level. It sounds like a lot of people had a lot to take away from it, which was great. And again, next month is uh, June 15th, I think, right? Yes, it's yep. gonna be His Girl Friday. Yeah, we'll have that up on the website soon to register for here. And please uh, keep an eye on our websites for information about reopening and uh, the opportunity to see the film back on the big screen. Um, so we will we'll look forward to seeing you at the theater and then seeing you back here on Zoom in about a month's time. And just uh, a final for plug for the TCM tonight. Festival. Oh, yeah, there please. Was, uh... It was great, and I, I there's a lot of content that will be still available on HBO Max, but I can't promise it will be available for long. So if you do have HBO Max, definitely check it out and see what uh, what's there. Enjoy. And can I say coming. rest in peace, Norman Lloyd at 100. Yes, rest years in old. peace, Norman Lloyd. Yes, uh, <laughs> I'll find I'll find a Norman Lloyd movie. We'll work it in there. Yeah, somewhere. yeah, it's a great idea. Absolutely. Thanks. There will be TCM is going to have a tribute to Norman Lloyd. I think. <laughs> June 14th, it was just announced. They're gonna have cool. a Norman Lloyd Festival day.
Thank you all. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.